Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Eladio Fernandez. I'm from the Dominican Republic. I'm a member of the ILCP, which is the International League of Conservation Photographers. I am a conservation photographer full time. Um, I've been working in photography and conservation for over 25 years. Um, and uh, especially with Ridgeway Saw. I got involved with this um, very um, rare bird in 21 years ago, in the year 2000. Um, and I'll explain a little. Ridgeway Hawk is an endemic small hawk species from the island of Hispaniola. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Caribbean geography, you know, we have the Greater Antilles, which are the lighter, the, the larger, the lesser Antilles. In the middle is the island of Hispaniola, which is divided into two countries, uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti. Haiti you, is in the news lately, not for something very good. It almost never is uh, in the news for something good, but um, they just had their president uh, killed and it's the same island. Um, so Ridgeway's hawk had a broad distribution throughout the island, including Haiti, you know, some of the satellite islands around, smaller sat satellite islands around uh, Hispaniola. But for some reason, it became increasingly rare. This is a rare um, um, print from Birds of Haiti in San Domingo by Charles B. Corey from 1885. And in the year 2000, we had the beginnings of a conservation effort by Peregrine Fund. So Peregrine Fund, which is an organization worldwide that is interested in preserving and the conservation of raptors, um, was got interested in Ridgeway's Hall, basically. And so they came here. We had very little information about this um, bird at that time. I mean, uh, Jim Wiley, if you're familiar with um, Caribbean um, ornithology, Jim Wiley from the US, an ornithologist from the US uh, had done some surveys and had <clears throat> provided some information regarding the number of eggs, you know, anything about the natural history of the bird. Jim Wiley was basically the, one of the people who provided mo the most information. So at that point in time, we did a census in the year 2000 and we estimated, uh, you know, that there were only about 200 individuals of the species left. And the majority, the great majority of them were restricted to one area. It's, it's, it's a national park called Los Aitises National Park in the Dominican Republic. So here's a historic distribution map for uh, Ridgeway Sauk on the island of Hispaniola. What you see on the left, all those red dots are spots or places where the hawk had been reported historically. That's, and then in the year 2000, when the project started, just one spot. Uh, for some reason, again, at that point in time, I had no idea what was going on, but, but definitely the species was going down very quickly. Um, so this is the spot, this uh, big green chunk of um, 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 patch of, of land that you see there called Los Aitises. Um, it's, it's a national park. It's got part of it is inside the, the Bay of Samana. Um, and it's a very complex area because it spreads out through several provinces. But mostly what characterizes this national park, it's its geology. Um, and we'll see it in a second. At that point in time, in the year 2000, there were almost no image, images of Ridgeway Saw. Um, when I started photography over 25 years ago, we didn't have any digital cameras. We were still doing um, uh, slides or, or film. And this is one of the first images, quality images of Ridgeway's Hawk in the year 2002 that I was able to get and that we had at all. This is a recent image, image of 
Ridgeway saw clearly with long, you know, lenses, um, digital cameras, and of course, it's been a huge help to be able to provide, you know, audiovisual material for this animal over the course of 25 years, over the course of 20 years. I'm sorry. So um, Ridgeway's hawk is a small hawk, and its diet, uh, most of its diet is composed of reptiles and amphibians. So here we have a picture of one taking us a, a snake, um, an endemic snake back to, to the nest, but we've seen it eat frogs, we've seen it eat, they have a special like for this particular lizard um, um, that lives on the rocks. So these birds will go in the forest, um, they'll find the perch, they'll, they'll look down, and basically they'll jump on their prey as it's like um, moving on the ground or, or coming out on top of a rock to sun itself. Um, they'll also pick off um, frogs from trees um, and we've seen them hunt birds. We've seen them, we've, we've found actually bats on their nests, you know, that were in their chicks. Um, so they have a, a very, you know, broad, um, a, you know, a diet, but restricted to very small animals because the bird is small. So they can't carry a lot of food. This is what Los Aitises National Park looks like. It's what we call cone karst. So you have to think of it as a carton of eggs. It's exactly like a carton of eggs. So you have these um, rock, limestone rock formations uh, covered in natural vegetation. And the, the National Park extends an area of 600 square kilometers. So most of that is cone karst. So when you think about this, these 600 square kilometers, there's, there's a lot of surface area. There's a lot of hunting ground for reptiles and amphibians. And this is probably one of the reasons why um, they are still, this is one of the last pockets of, of, of the population of Ridgeway's Hawk. It's a beautiful place. You know, the areas of Los Aitises National Park that are close to the water are impressive. I'm sure you've seen images similar to this, not necessarily from the Dominican Republic, but um, other places in, on the, in the planet, on the planet that um, are very similar. For example, in Vietnam, I think China has cone, cone cars as well. Um, and uh, some areas in, um, in the Pacific Ocean as well, I think some islands. Um, and of course, the marine area is, is a great place also for other bird species. Um, these are um, the foundations of an old um, uh, pier that was used for exporting bananas. And, you know, it's a good resting place for birds now. The place, the coastal areas of Los Aitises National Park is also a mangrove area, uh, you know, covered in red mangrove mostly. So you have these buttressing roots that cover all the edge, all that fringe, that coastal fringe of the park. Inside the park, we have beautiful broadleaf um, tropical forest. Uh, you can see that rock on the, on the right in the foreground, and that's the way the karst formations or the limestone formations look inside the forest. Um, and of course, we have people who live inside a national park. And you, you, might, you might ask yourself, people living inside a national park, well, that's unheard of. Well, it, the thing is, these lands were occupied by people before they were national parks. So then the government, the Dominican government came, basically realized that there was a lot of biodiversity in these areas worth protecting and established these national parks. For the most part, back then, this is 1976, the strategy or the policy was to basically kick people out. And so they would kick people out of the national park and they would have to find fend for, for themselves and find another way of, of making a living. But national parks in the Dominican Republic are also 
um, not well protected. So people have a tendency to go back to what were what, their lands. You know, some of those lands were cleared already and they still do agriculture inside and then take the, whatever they're, they're harvesting, they take it out from the park and then they sell it outside the park. So it's not supposed to happen legally, but it's, it's still, that's the way it is. So this, we have a new government in place in the Dominican Republic that's looking to fix some of these issues. But the problem is in Los Aitises, like I said, it's spread out through a series of provinces. And it's very hard controlling in every different province what happens inside the park. So, you know, this is what some of those cone karst areas look like now. They're denuded, basically. You know, fire from clearing, you know, some land in between these, these hills has spread to the hills and actually, you know, burnt everything down. Um, it looks green because it rains on it and then everything gets you know, uh, starts growing back back on it, but not, once you've lost that original natural forest, you're never gonna get it back. So the project started um, in an area called Los Limones, which is a small community on the very edge of Los Aitises National Park. That is our main headquarters. That's where our, our headquarters are. And when you hear headquarters, it sounds like we have a huge office with a lot of, you know, luxury. And but that, that's not the case. But see, this is the map again of Hispaniola. You see the square in uh, pink, and I've expanded that square. That little red dot that says Los Limones is where the town is, and in and on the very edge of Los Aitises National Park. So this is our luxury accommodation headquarter in, uh, in Los Limones. You know, we have, we basically bought one of the community, a house from one of the community members and, you know, created three rooms. Uh, sometimes we get volunteers. Uh, we cook our, our own food there. We store, we use the house for storing things, et cetera. And of course, sometimes we don't have electricity. Um, very early in the morning, uh, the team wakes up, we've hired a lot of community people to work on this project, but it's still run by some folks like Thomas Hayes, as you see here in the middle of the, of the image, who works for Peregrine Fund. He's the in-country you know in -country project director, Thomas Hayes, and these are some of the folks from the community that are helping us out and getting paid for. They make a living off of uh, uh, the Ridgeway Hawk Conservation Program. So first of all, you know, the work starts, the heavy work starts maybe in February when we, we start to pinpoint places where we see pairs, pairs of hawks that are mating, maybe carrying sticks, building their nests. Um, generally, as you might know that birds from the genus Budio, um, have territories and they're fixed ter territories and they might use the same nest year after year or if not they might build a new nest very close to the old nest so uh, we have areas where we have established pairs but we have to go check on them uh, starting in february but the big work starts basically in march march all the way to july um, at this point we're closing the nesting season in Dominican Republic for Ridgeway's Hawk. And one of our uh, you know, team members has to climb the tree where the nest is. Generally, we have an endemic bird. It's our national bird. They're called palm chats. It's a very, it's a monotyp monotypic genus called Dulles. The species is Dominicus, Dulles Dominicus. They build this platform nest full of twigs and sticks uh, in these uh, royal palm trees. And Ridgeways um, is, is a little lazy. So they, they, they basically see that nest and they say, wow, someone's already built a platform for me. And basically they take over the nest and, and um, they fix the nest at, at the very top. And uh, still with the palm chats 
under it. So palm chats basically burrow in this stick structure and they have you know different apartments and maybe 70 palm chats might share one of these nets and the nest might have a ridgeways hawk nesting on it. And of course, every time the ridgeways comes in, all the palm chats fly out. It must be very stressful for some of these birds. Anyhow, so uh, one of our uh, team members has to climb. They, they put a platform to, so they can stand and check um, the tree. I mean, the, the nest, check on the chicks. This is a little video from this year. So basically you have a, uh, between one and three chicks. Most, most of the time you have two, sometimes you have three. Um, and basically it's a long, um, uh, they spend a long time, a long period, um, almost a month in the nest. Um, of course, when this uh, crew member or this team member climbs upon, the parents get very upset and they come and they try to um, strike the, the person who's climbed the tree. And there's a reason we have every single nest. So in the area of Los Limones, we have close to 70 nests. Imagine over a period between March and July, every single nest needs to be climbed at least twice. So, and this is the reason why we have to climb. Uh, basically, we bring the chicks down in a, in a cloth bag from the nest. The team um, member who's up on the nest, they sits down on the platform and waits for another team member to process the chicks. That little black spot that you see there is a botfly larva. So we have a species of uh, botfly called Philornis pc. Philornis, the genus, the, the name Philornis means bird lover. And it's basically a botfly whose entire life cycle revolves around um, basically laying eggs on a recently hatched chick of any bird species. Once the eggs hatch, the larva then burrow under the skin of the chick and they feed on blood and tissue. So um, there's a huge population of these um, larvae. And if we do not pull the, the larva off the chicks once they're born, um, basically a chick could have up to 100 larvae and they would eat them alive. So we were wondering why Ridgeway Hawk had disappeared you know, so quickly in such a short amount of time. And basically this is one of the biggest threats that the species is facing. Not only this species, but other species in Dominican Republic. So I know that was a gross shot. Some of you might be upset right now at looking at that, but, but uh, it's important and that we know. And um, we found a product called Permacat through research. So the nests are sprayed with permacap and that is why we have to go up to the nest. Chicks have to be processed, the, the larvae have to be pulled out and then the, the nest has to be sprayed. And basically one spraying will take care of the flies for the whole time that the chicks are on the nest. And we have to climb a second time once the chicks are older so we can ban the chicks. So this is what's going on in these images that you're seeing. And chicks are placed back again in the nest, except in some cases. Since Ridgeway's hawk are restricted to one area, the Peregrine Fund decided through this uh, method that is called hacking to start two other populations outside of Los Itises. And the reason being is if a, like we were discussing at the beginning of I asked and myself, you know, if we have a big event like a hurricane, if we have a hurricane, then, you know, it could wipe out the entire species. So, you know, we wanna, we don't wanna leave all our eggs in one basket. We wanna start, you know, uh, reestablishing Ridgeway's hawk in historic places where they've been reported before. So we sometimes we take 25 chicks. This is the way we carry them. We 
put them in a box um, with some plantain, dried plantain leaves at the bottom. We close the box. We take him for like eat him back to the um, um, headquarters. And then um, we head to the hack sites. So we have two hack sites. One's called Punta Cana, which is a resort area. Um, and the other one is in Los Brazos. Uh, Los Brazos is a small community that lives off uh, organic cacao. Um, so here we're back on the map again. We see Los Limones in the center. And then we see where Los Brazos is, is nearby, west of Los Limones. And then we see where Punta Cana, the Punta Cana Resort is, is on the um, southeastern coast of Dominican Republic. And so you ask yourself, you know, why a resort? Well, this resort has a very big environmental program. And they thought they have areas within the resort that are untouched, still have original forest, very good habitat. So they offered, you know, their um, basically um, place for as a hacking site for us to reestablish ridgeways. Of course, ridgeways had been reported in the area in the past. So it just made sense. And that was the first hacking project that we had in the Dominican Republic. So hacking a hack site basically is composed of a, a, a tall tower built on steel. Um, there's a platform at the very top and there's a box with some bars. The chicks are taken as old as we can from the nest and they are placed inside the box. Um, and you know, it, it doesn't matter that, that you have three, four, five, six, seven chicks in one of these boxes. They don't fight with each other. They respect their space. And, but they, basically what they do is they, three, they see through the bars and they start basically learning what their habitat and their surroundings are. And after a week of being inside the box and fed twice a day, they are let out onto the platform. So, you know, that's, uh, we take food twice a day, um, early in the morning, very early in the morning and very late in the evening. We have to also get the old food out of the, uh, because it starts to rot and it starts to attract uh, turkey vultures. So the hogs have all the information in their genes that they, that they need. They don't need to learn from necessarily from their parents. Um, so they start to learn, learn how to fly on their own. Um, they become familiar with the surroundings. They uh, might perch on the vegetation surrounding the box as they get older. This is another very gross image, and I'm sorry if I'm grossing you out with a couple of these things, but it's it's the fact. It's a fact. You know, this is the way it's done, and this is the way we preserve endangered species. And these are rats that are bred specifically for food um, by um, trained people. And we have to cut them in pieces. And basically, we have to zip tie them to the platform. Sometimes we just haul them up uh, using uh, a pulley system. So, you know, the hogs start to grow and become independent all on their own. Sometimes they don't come back to the site for a couple of days. Um, and this process goes on from, you know, possibly uh, May, June, July, till about October. So uh, around the month of October is when these hawks have already learned how to hunt on their own, become independent and start establishing themselves in territories. Um, this is already a very independent, very healthy looking um, one-year-old um, Ridgeway's hawk. Um, as you see in the, in the genus Buteo, some of these juveniles look very similar to each other, like red tails hawk, hawks, and, and maybe some of these, maybe the broad wing hawk also has similar juvenile plume, plumage. Um, so, but this is a, a ridgeway at one of our hacking sites um, that's doing very well. Um, we have a crew of community people at each one of the sites with scopes. They keep tabs on a daily basis uh, to see what hawks return to the hack site for supplementary food. And 
and then um, the process starts year after year. We declare hacking a hacking site to be successful when we've had pairs of hogs that are they start nesting and breeding and successfully uh, successfully uh, fledge, um, you know their their chicks. And this has happened already in both sites. Um, so in Punta Cana, it's been going on for a number of years already. Um, so it's been a very successful range reduction program in Punta Cana and Los Brazos is the latest. And this year we had our first, our first pair of hogs nesting and, and producing chicks. Uh, unfortunately, the chicks um, uh, died of natural causes. Uh, we think predation might have been one of the uh, um, um, uh, possibilities. So we can't declare that Los, uh, Los Brazos is entirely successful yet, but hopefully by next year, we, we, we will be able to. Um, of course, you know, we're doing, we're establishing, you know, new or reestablishing populations of Ridgeway Sock in areas that haven't seen them for a while. So there has to be an education program. Um, we have a couple of institutions that are affiliated, local institutions. One is Fundación Propagás, the other one's Fundación Grupo Punta Cana, and the other one's local uh, zoo, the Sodom. Um, and all three organizations uh, work on environmental education regarding Ridgeway Sock in their respective places. So um, this is Mar Marta Curti. She is one of the Peregrine Fund's um, education coordinators. And she comes to the, the area of Punta Cana and gets on a bicycle that was donated to the, to the um, program and then basically bikes over to local communities. She's, she gives out pamphlets. Uh, she sits down with people and explains, and then uh, obviously tells them what they eat. Um, and there's a high concern always because people in the Caribbean, and I'm sure this happens in Trinidad also, and Tobago, where Faraz lives, um, if people raise a lot of chickens. Not necessarily for food. Yes, they, they do that for food, but cockfighting is still allowed in some of our countries. It's allowed in the Dominican Republic. And a lot of people raise chicks for cockfighting, and those chicks are very expensive. So you know, people when they see raptors, you know, red-tailed hawks, ridgeway hawks, you know, any other raptor, generally shoot them um, without you know finding out any more information, just to protect their chicks. So we explain to them these are small hawks; these don't eat chicks. You know, we explain what they eat. And we constantly talk with the same people over and over, over the course of many years. So this has proven to work very well. You know, people now identify and can tell the difference between a red tail hawk and a ridgeway hawk. So um, it's been very successful. Also, Marta does radio tracking. So we, on the females, sometimes that we re release, we put these transmitter backpacks on them. And uh, you can see here one on the, on the very, on the back, you can see it has a little backpack with a little antenna on it. Uh, the antenna is sticking out through the tail feathers, in fact. So um, this doesn't harm the bird and eventually um, the strap just um, rot and the, um, the, the, the transmitter falls out. And, uh, so this is, you know, since females are the ones that uh, basically um, establish, you know, are the ones that are always on the nest. If we want to find nests where we do the re-releases, you know, we have to sometimes put transmitters on females and see where they're going. We don't do this anymore in Punta Cana because, you know, uh, we have well-established, a well-established population, but initially just to check on the birds and and make sure that they're alive and that they're still, still doing well over the course of time. So um, not only um, do we do hacking, but some of our folks, uh, some of the folks in, in, the, in the Peregrine Fund are falconers. And it, you know sometimes falconers have different skills in biologists. And some of these skills can be very useful, especially 
when it comes to um, helping some birds that require a little extra attention. So I'll show you a little video that a friend of mine, Marvin Del Cid, made. It's a time lapse of how the wing of one chick was actually repaired using feathers from the wing of a similar chick of a corpse, basically. You know, we had one chick fail or die in, in the nest. We collected the, the, the corpse. We freeze them until we find out we, we can do an autopsy. It turned out that we retrieved this one chick whose wings had been cut by a human. I mean, when we say cut wings, we, we, we're talking about feathers. So they take a, a pair of scissors, they cut him so they could keep him as a pet. We were able to retrieve and rescue the bird, but the bird was a, at a very critical stage where it needed to learn how to fly. And so it, we couldn't wait for it to molt. So we had to fix the feathers and this is how it, it was done. There we see Thomas preparing all the feathers, the primaries, the secondaries. Um, that's his wife, Christine. She's a biologist. Both of them know how to do this technique. It's, it takes a lot of time, a lot of patience. That was impressive. I mean, the dedication that 
these guys, you know, um, Thomas and Christine, they have a little daughter called Mojave, um, who was very young, who was very young when they started to come here to the Dominican Republic. They come every year, they live here for six months um, in the headquarters at Los Limones and, and Punta Cana. They, they split their time between both places. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a very committed family to the conservation of one species. And, it, you know, it's very impressive. You know, when I, when I say, you know, the, the species has been recovering, it's, it's basically due to the effort of a very small group of people. So, you know, even you don't need large armies of people to bring back species from extinction. So the population when we started in the year 2000 was estimated at 200 individuals. And in 2021, we're, we haven't done a formal census, but given the number of nests and fledglings we have, we estimate the population to be around 500. So it's taken 21 years of learning a lot about a species, a bird, and, um, and, and bringing it back from the brink of extinction. Of course, recently, you know, last year, uh, I, I should say in the year 2019, we received a little bit of unexpected news. And uh, this was really interesting, but basically a friend of mine who's a, a, a biologist, his name is Anderson John, was doing surveys in the southwestern um, peninsula of Tiburon in Haiti in a little island called Petit Caimit. And when he landed on the island, the first thing he saw on a gumbo limbo tree was a juvenile hawk that looked like a Ridgeway's hawk. Of course, we've all thought that Ridgeways have been extinct, extinct, extinct in Haiti for more than you know, 50 years, basically. And there had been no reports, of course, there are very few biologists, very few ornithologists in Haiti, very few people looking for these animals out in the wild. But Anderson took a photograph, sent it to us. This is the photo. Um, and basically um, we weren't sure. So we put together an expedition on the year of the pandemia in January when the pandemia had not exploded yet. We went to Haiti, Thomas Hayes, myself, um, a Anderson Jean, and we brought a camera person. I'm working on a documentary series called Island Naturalist. So about my conservation work and my conservation photography work. And one of the episodes was about Ridgeway's Hawk. And of course, so we went out there and we took a chance on trying to find the bird again. And I'm going to show you the last bit, unreleased bit of information. This is not published yet, nor is this video finished. It hasn't been colorized. It hasn't been um, a sound design. It hasn't been properly edited. But you know, I will show you the last clip that has to do with that trip in Haiti that we took. It's in Spanish, so I'll try to narrate what's going on every now and then. No estamos seguros, pero parece que es un gavilán que hace 100 años que nadie reporta un gavilán en el mundo. Y por eso me voy con Thomas a las islas Cayamites a tratar de corroborar el habitante. So basically I'm saying we're going to Grand Cayamite to try to find Ridgeway's Hawk based on that photograph. I don't know if you got it. This is Grand Caimit. There's two islands. This is the big island. It's a very small island called Petit Caimit. Petit Caimit is Petit Caimit is where the uh, where Anderson saw it, but we wanted to explore the larger island first. Thomas is an expert at calling, you know, using his fingers and a little blade of grass, calling, imitating the, the call of the hawk. En la naturaleza no hay garantías. El primer día fue un fracaso. So our first day at Grand Cayman, Esta vegetación es un ambiente altamente impactado por la gente. 
de aquí se sacan muchísimos kilos de carbón. Y este proceso constante no permite que el bosque se regenere. Se han perdido la mayoría de los árboles grandes. So a lot of the habitat has been impacted by charcoal making. We didn't find any hawks the first day. So we're going to go on the second day to Petit Caimí, to where the sighting took place. Let's see. By the way, Haiti, contrary to what you hear, is a beautiful place. The people are extremely nice, and there's this tons is, of good news. This is going to be our second day out in Kayami looking for the Ridgeway Hawk. There's tons of good news in that country. It just never makes it to the Las Kayami son dos islas. To the media. Gran Kayami y Petit Kayami. Petit Kayami es una isla que se ve que tuvo algún tipo de impacto pero como que la han dejado tranquila y la vegetación está en un estado de recuperación. We use playbacks uh, constantly to see if we get a response from birds. Ahí está Thomas usando el canto. A ver si responde. El canto es muy singular. Y puede confirmar la identificación del ave por sonido solamente, por su canto. So this is when we hear the birds. So we found two Ridgeway's hawks flying around with some turkey vultures. This is actual footage from the birds that we saw. A pesar del deterioro en la isla, el gavilán parece que persiste. En este viaje confirmamos que todavía queda una población aislada en Haití. So, um, we basically found three birds. Um, since then, Anderson John has returned and in Grand Caille Meat, he found six other birds. They might be the same birds that we saw, we just don't know, but, but there seems to be a population that's still persisting in Haiti, which is great because this uh, ornithologist by the last name of Abbott collected six specimens in Grand and Petit Caille in 1918 and the last time bird was seen on those islands. But the last time anyone saw a Ridgeway Hawk in Haiti was in Ile Vache, another um, small satellite island off the coast of um, Lecay, uh, where six, another six specimens were collected in 1962. That's, you know, over close to 60 years ago. And um, uh, 59 years ago. And this is great news. And of course, what you're hearing right now hasn't been published. We're on maybe fourth or fifth draft of, of publication um, that we're gonna make on this subject. And so it's going to be published very soon, and you'll see it also in the episode of Island Naturalist when it comes out in September. So, you know, like I said, um, it, what started out as a grim um, situation for Ridgeways in the year 2000 
is turning out to be a success story for the species on the island of Hispaniola, and not only in Dominican Republic, but also in Haiti, uh, which is great. So we're looking, you know, in the future, to, we're looking to the possibilities when, once the political and um, situation um, becomes a little bit more, um, uh, uh, you know, you know um, uh, where there's less trouble in Haiti, um, to maybe start another Ridgeway's Hawk conservation program in Haiti in the future. So now we have four spots in terms of the distribution in the, Dominican, in the, in the island of Hispaniola, three in the Dominican Republic and one in Haiti, possibly more in Haiti. So we just got to get more eyes on the, on the ground for these things. And so that's the end of my presentation. I thank you very much. Um, these are the four organizations, the four logos that you see, the Peregrine Fund, Fundación Propagas, uh, the Punta Cana Ecological Foundation and, and the uh, Sodom, our, our local zoo, are the ones that are involved with the conservation of the species. If you have any uh, questions, um, I think we may have a little bit of time. Um, uh, at the end, I'll stop uh, sharing screen, return to Faraz and let him take it from there. Yeah, sorry, I was talking and I was still on mute. <laughs> Classic, <laughs> it happens all the time. Yeah, thank you for that. That was a fascinating presentation on so many different levels. Um, I think the one thing that stood out to me was um, how they how they they grafted the feathers into the the injured bird's wing yes um yeah we, we had a problem with a with an albatross that we found here that had its wings cut people tried to somehow keep it as a pet um maybe some fishermen found it or something like that and i think i was speaking with lisa Sorensen about that from uh, birds caribbean and she mentioned that this this there's this technique that some people can use um but I, I hadn't heard of it. And this is the first time that I've actually seen, uh, you know, video footage of it. So that's incredible. Yes, six hours it took to repair that wing. Imagine wow. if, if that happens on a constant basis. I mean, yeah, yeah. But, but when you have an endangered species, you know, every individual is worth, you know, the oh, yeah. valuable, so. Oh yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so, of course, you know, um, anyone who has any questions um, about this, um, please, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, seeing one, um, have you experimented with nesting platforms? We have good success for ospreys here, and that's in the New York. Yes, um, not necessarily. We we find th these. Um, th this other endemic species, the Dulus dominicus, the palm chat. Um, is is a very common bird. I mean, it's it's a monotypic genus, so people when they come here bird watch and think it's going to be a very rare species, but it's it's probably in the backyard of the airport, you know, nesting on a palm tree. So um, the these platforms on these palms are very common in Los Aitises National Park and other places, and and palms these royal palms are very common as well. So. It, we haven't had a need for building artificial platforms. They basically take over those um, palm chat nests and, and they build, a, you know, build on them. There's an area inside Los Aitises, especially in the northern section, northern coast, close to the water, where there are no palm trees. And uh, the, the ones that we found there are, are building their own nests. And obviously they're using broadleaf trees, you know, and to, to build a, a, their own nesting platforms. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bird that if it sees you made it easy for him, he'll take advantage of that fact. And uh, in fact, um, in, in one of the old hacking sites, the tower was still standing and, and it still had the, the hacking box on top of it. So, Thomas one year saw what, you know, a pair bringing twigs to try to build a nest on top of it. And he had an old nest that he had collected and kept in the, in the laboratory. So he took that old nest and placed it there for them. I mean, that's, you know, 
how how much easier can he make it for the hogs to and, and they nest it on the platform so they they will use an artificial platform if they think it's uh it's something that will save them you know constructing their own so nice uh, and they they provide uh, some kind of level of protection for the palm shots the the palm shots don't seem to mind no they they get scared when they fly in and they tend to fly out screaming yeah, I imagine the stress level on a palm chat nest when there's a ridgeway nesting on top, is very <laughs> high. But they don't seem to hunt them. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to hunt them. Um, we we've seen some bird remnants on nests from other bird species, but uh, but not palm chats. Interesting. Interesting. Um, what about the regular prey species uh, in terms of the the lizard that they like to feed on? Um, that's pretty stable. Yes, um, Los Aitises, because it has all that surface area, you know, it's not a flat piece of ground, but it has all these cone cars, hills, and it's very rocky. It's full of prey. I mean, they, we have these large and old lizards. They, it's called a giant canopy, an old uh, lizard, uh, Anolis baleatus. And then mm -hmm. we have the, these rock uh, dwelling species that basically burrow and they make their life on their, on their uh, stones. But in the early day, they have to get on the stone to catch a little heat so they can become active. And I think that's when, when they catch them. Uh, so th those are called galley wasps. And, and you mm -hmm. might have some in, in maybe in Trinidad yeah. and Tobago. Um, yeah, we have a few um, different anoles. A lot of our anoles are actually introduced, interestingly, from, from uh, some of the other islands. There is yes. one. There is one interestingly called Anolis trinitatis that was first discovered um, and described in Trinidad, but it turns out to be uh, a Saint Vincent native. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it is. That's how it goes sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. I think. Um, I think you blew everyone away with uh, with this. <laughs> I hope that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing, you know. Um, blowing minds is always a it's always a nice thing. Um, yeah, if I'm thinking, uh, if anyone has any other questions, please say it now, or else um, it's it's bye bye time. Yeah, I will comment that uh, you know uh, I'll add this little bit. You know, you might have signed on to see a lot of bird images, and you might have, you know I try to include as much of the habitat and the bird as possible, but. Um, you know, people are a big component of the conservation work and, and conservation photography is about that. For example, you and I have discussed this in the past, you know, uh, when we start out in, you know, photographing nature, we're basically nature photographers. We try to mm -hmm. photograph the beautiful side of nature, you know, the bird portraits, the landscapes, the sunsets, the seascapes, the trees, the, the forest. But uh, conservation photographers, we tend to focus on all the nasty stuff like deforestation, threats, mm -hmm. um, you know, dead rats on a feed, you know, on a platform for yeah, you know, for for fledgings and and that kind of thing. And we also focus on the human aspect because it's important to show that you know, yes, humans are are part of the reason that this hawk is, is in danger, but humans can also be part of the reason why, you know, it's being saved or it's coming back. So, exactly. you know, this is, this is a, a, you know, a happy ending. Well, maybe not an ending yet, but it's, it's so far, it's a happy story of a bird mm -hmm. that was on the brink of extinction. And now we're, you know, with the help of humans, we're bringing it back. So for me, photographing people in the process of bringing a bird species back was important. Yeah, yeah, of course, it's a necessary part of the documentation process, you know. Um, what about uh, in terms of uh, local attitudes towards the birds? Uh, have they been changing? Yes, the local population, of course, we're working tightly with the community, especially in Los Limones is where Fundación Propagas works. And, you know, we, we bought like baseball is a national, you know, um, pastime here. So so we bought the local um, kids a uniforms that said Los Gavilanes. Uh, Gavilanes yeah. The name for Ridgeway's Hawk. 
Yeah. And, uh, so now, you know, they identify themselves with the, the bird that lives in their backyards. And it's interesting because these birds are highly tolerant of people. So, um, you know, we name the couples or the nests uh, according to the person who owns the property. So okay. basically, yeah, so you'll have like someone, a, a local farmer yeah. with, with, with a garden where he's planting all kinds of things. There's a palm in the middle of it and it's got a Ridgeway hawk nest on it. So uh, his name might be Pedro Morel. So we say the nest at Pedro Morel or the couple at Pedro Morel. And so we are able to identify the couple by the person who owns the property. Interesting. And, yeah, and we yeah. work with them and we explain to them you know, some, some of them who fear that the, the birds might be hunting their chicks, we give them cages. Mm -hmm. free. So when yeah. they're recently hatched and very small, they keep them in a cage where they, we buy them sometimes um, maize and corn and stuff and they feed them, you know, inside the cage. And once they reach a certain size, Ridgeway's hawk is not going to take it. They know it. So, mm -hmm. so then they can release the chicks for them to roam free in the backyard. And, and yeah. And yeah. not have any of them disappear. So, you know, we, we're working working very closely. We listen to the community. You know, community is part of the project. We do education for the kids. There's murals in the communities. Mm -hmm. on Hawk. And but there's always someone who is just, you know, not willing to collaborate and has like a bit a problem with one nesting pair. And you know, but that happens everywhere. So. Um, uh, you know, we, we don't try to be mean to that person or anything like that. We just try to handle the situation as best as we can. Yeah, of course. I think it's all about getting the majority to buy into, you know, just that involvement in the project. And especially how, how the, the birds are named after the property owners and everything. That, that I think, is a, is a fantastic initiative to have um, that community engagement going on. Um, Elizabeth wants to know if there's a website for the program or if you need contributions. Yes, I'm, I'm writing donations for this. You can earmark a donation, basically say, I want the money to go specifically to the Ridgeway, Ridgeway's Hawk Conservation Program in the Dominican Republic. But the recipient would be the Peregrine Fund in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm writing that on the chat as we speak. Um, the Peregrine Fund has a website. You'll find information on Ridgeway's there. We don't have a you know, a particular web page for the bird specifically. We have a Facebook page, um, you know, that doesn't receive a lot of, you know, posts or anything like that. But basically, you know, the place to go would be the Peregrine Fund, the, the website for the Peregrine Fund. Donations sure. can be sent there as well. And if, if anyone else wants to keep abreast of, of the project, should they follow you on uh, social media? Yes, I, I generally post, uh, you know, uh, we're about to go into uh, the latent uh, phase of the project where basically we don't do anything for six months, but um, we let it be. But things will start again in February and, and I start posting images every, every year I go there. I'm a volunteer. I'm on the board of uh, directors for the, they have to establish a local organization to be able to pay and, and pay their taxes and stuff like that. So we have Fondo Peregrino, Rene, I'm on that board. Um, but I, I, I work on a volunteer basis. And, you know, when Thomas Hayes is not here um, in, in the Dominican Republic and there's a problem, I generally have to go and attend it. Um, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a, you know, 21 years, it's almost like a lifetime commitment now to, to a bird species. You don't realize it, but time flies um, very quickly. Of course, but you have, at least you have something to show for it now that you know that those there are some more red dots on the island of Hispaniola. Um, well, I just put your Instagram um, account in the in the chat if anyone's interested. Uh, another question: Have you thought about bird cams to help get local people interested? So um, I'm assuming these are nesting cams. Yes, I I placed we place GoPros every now and then on nests. Sometimes they're not well received by by the nesting pair. They see it as a you know you can camouflage it as much as you want, but they see something that's different. And um, you know once we have chicks, we don't want to disturb the birds too much. Mm -hmm. 
if they're bringing back food and you put a camera up for like five hours, that's five hours the chick is not getting fed and, and we don't want to do that. So um, this year I put a camera up, I found a tolerant, uh, what I do is I put a rope on it and, and, and it snaps off if I need to yank it without having to climb the tree again. Um, so we generally put the, the cameras up and we give it a try and we see like in a couple of hours, the bird has not returned to the chicks and we, we pull it off. Uh, but I did find, because it's important also for scientific purposes to see what they're bringing back, how they cut up the food, what they do with it, you know. Um, so I did put a camera up and I managed to get some nice footage and it was a very tolerant um, mother who, generally the, the female is the one that brings the food back to the nest. The, the, the male might go hunting. He'll scream in a particular way and meet her on a, on a perch. So she'll fly out of the nest and he'll exchange the food with her and she'll bring it back to the, to the nest and then she will feed the chicks. Every now and then you'll get a male that, that goes to the nest and feeds the chick, but it's not, it's, it's for the most part, it's the females that are feeding the chicks. So um, we got a very tolerant female that wasn't upset about the camera and she allowed us to film her and, and it was very useful. So yes, we have to be very careful with these things um, uh, sometimes. Good, um, pretty cool. Yeah, the the welfare of the bird is always um, the top priority. Yes. So yeah, that's that's way more important than people getting to see. Uh, you know, we just you just have to work your way around and get that community engagement in a, in another uh, fashion. Yeah, we don't use drones either because mm -hmm. you know they'll be perceived as something um, that could be attacked and the bird can get injured or yeah or yeah we, we don't we. We refrain from doing that as well. Yeah, we try yeah. to be careful as we can. Yeah, because these uh, these are not large, um, particularly large birds either. They're kind of medium, small to medium sized. Raptors. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're larger than uh, an American kestrel or kestrel species, but but way smaller than a than a red tail hawk. Red tail. Yeah. yeah. They're around uh, maybe smaller than a broad winged. Yes, uh, I, we we believe that the closest relative this bird might have because of the plumage colors and the behavior it might be a broad wing hawk. Mm -hmm. So yes, I we think it's it's uh, close, you know, closely related and definitely like an, an approximate size. So nice, nice. Okay, well, well, I'd like to thank you um, very much um, from from on behalf of everyone here and everyone at Learn the Birds. Uh, for this wonderful presentation and thank you everyone for coming as well and I believe that's I, I think I, I touched everyone uh, on the chat um, a lot of congratulations and, and gratitude thank flowing you. your way you. um, so yeah so thanks so much uh, Eladio and thanks everyone for coming and I guess we'll catch up again some other time Yes, hopefully, and and we get to meet each other personally, uh, you know, after following each other for for such a number of years. Oh yeah, yeah. of course, that's definitely on the cards. <laughs> yeah, All right, thank you for having me and for the invitation, and thank you everybody for attending. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Cheers.